There are basically two opposing systems of taxonomy, or, and uh, one of them is the traditional way of using morphology, the shape, the visual features of plants and flowers, usually just the flower to put things together. The other one is genetic research, molecular research alone, which comes out as complicated sometimes diagrams from the computer. Both of these systems have traps. If you only use visual features, you may end up putting flowers together that are not really related, because these unrelated plants have adapted the same kind of pollination strategy. The molecular traps are when people use misidentified specimens, or contaminated specimens, or switch labels in the lab, or there are computer reaches. All of these things have happened, and will happen. So how do I handle this? Well, I think the best way is to combine those two. I look at the genetic cladograms, the, the DNA trees first, to get as a guideline for a few, uh, additional work. And then I try to find visual features to combine workable systems. Oops, not one of those again. I had problems figuring out what was what was seen here. So I decided, well, how about if I simplify it a little bit? You should see this as a... have to find the right button here. See this as a symbolic timeline, evolution. And at some point, there was a switch here, and a little group established itself. We call it Vitae Cortis today. It's way back in history. And the Vincitium Excavatum is in this group here. At some point later on, there's another split, and the heterontocedium clay evolved. These are the ones that have the aborted flowers. A little later on, the, what we call typical oncidiums took off in one direction, and what we eventually call typical odontoglossums took off the other way. Somewhere along the way, sigma crystallics split off from this branch here. Now, I would like to draw the line here and call everything about here or on the closer, which may be hard to digest for some of you, but there is method in the genetics. But before we go into any details, let's look at all these different sections. There are six sections on Sibioides. You have the Lobelotum section, Coloroptum section, Parviflorum section, Canaliculotum section, and Articulotum section. What do they look like? Don't worry about the names. Just look at what the flowers look like, particularly from the side. And wow, there's an Oncidium flower there. Well, that's what the section is called, Oncidioides, it means Oncidium. Here is the Coloroptum section, that's the old Cochleoda. Parviflora refers to the small flower species of former Solenidiopsis. Lobelotum refers to the lobes of the column here. Canaliculotum refers to the channel shaped lip or canaliculated lip. Articulotum refers to the articulated lip, which you can flip back and forth without breaking it. So these are visual morphological features that are useful to, to split up this whole complex. When DNA became available for this group of orchids, it turned out that a small group of plants that have flowers looking like oncidiums really were closer and related to odontoglossids than the typical oncidiums. Wow, so how did that ever happen? We don't know yet. So I decided, well, we can't use the flowers to define them as odontoglossids. We have to find other reasons, other features. So I started to look elsewhere. I looked at the vegetative features. Good little coffee this morning. And uh, as you can see here, this is an Odontoglossum Boothiae, originally described as Concedium Boothiae. But look at the bulbs here, pseudobulbs. They're glossy, they're sort of slightly compressed. They have this purple mottling, and they uh, unifoliate. It has only one leaf per bulb. These are features that are very typical for this oncidioid section. 
the plants look just like other odontoglossums. In almost every single case, they have these purple modules, and they also have one single leaf at the top. A couple of cases, like uh, Pictum and Opercycloides, every other bulb can have two leaves, but every other bulb can have only one leaf. So it's easy to recognize this group even without flowers. Now there is one small group of plants, more related to Oncetans, that have similar features like this, but the flowers are totally different. That's the Oncetium fuscatus or Cameliorchis section. We don't have time to talk about those here. They can be easily uh, distinguished by the flower morphology. So that is why I include them in Odontoglossum, despite having similar looking flowers. They have, there are Odontoglossum plants that have evolved into a similar pollination strategy as many other Oncetiums. Don't look at the names, because uh, really I mean, pretty uninteresting. Look at the shape, the side view of the column, the lid here. This is the Picton series of Monsignoides. It's a group by itself, and they can be distinguished together, can be kept together by these large column wings. Very distinct feature for all these seven species. The other series in the, in the Monsignoides they don't have these colonies. So maybe, since they came out as separate clades, as separate little branches in the evolution, maybe you could describe them as separate genera using this feature. But I don't like that, because there are so many other features that put them together. The plants look identical, or most of the flowers look very similar. And I'll show you why. Next, there. If you take Oncidium, former Oncidium, my mistake, Odontoglossum. If you take Odontoglossum pictum from the pictum series and compare it with Odontoglossum tipuloides from the chrysomorphum series, they are virtually identical. And even in the side view, they are virtually identical. The only thing that differs is that pictum has a slightly larger column wing. There is a column wing there as well, but it's very small. Uh, would you justify treating them as separate genera, a new genera, creating new names for these two? I prefer not to. One of our Chase's main argument for lumping everything into a big Oncidium bag was that he didn't like to create new genera, particularly monotypic genera. I think that's the only thing I agree with Mark Chase on, that I don't like to create new genera either. If there are all the names, why not use them? Yeah. There you go. That's why I have kept this little strange group of oncidium looking odontoglossums in the series by itself. Because if you decide to cut here or here or somewhere else for odontoglossum, these two have to be separate genera. And some of these clays that consist of a single species in what I call the lobelotum section here would also have to be monotypic genera one after the other, with new names. Why? I think it's unnecessary. Let's take a close look at uh, what Lobelotum, section Lobelotum really means, or refers to. You don't need to worry about these or the names or anything, just look down here. You can see that all species have these lateral lobes on the column. Very distinct. In, more, in some cases the lobes are yellow, but not always. In most cases, they have large uh, hoods on the top. But there are some troublemakers that don't. They look a little different here. So we're going to take a little closer look at those. What about the Glossum Povidanum, known from Colombia alone? Strange looking thing here. It has the yellow lobes on the column, so it's a good global optimum plant, and DNA proves that. But it doesn't have the hood. Penniafolium, again, has lobes, but they're white. It doesn't have the hood, but DNA shows it belongs to the other. This strange little character, though, is the smallest flower in the genus, less than a centimeter. It has features from two different sections. I put it in uh, Lobelotta because it has the yellow lobes, 
and it has the hood color. But it also has the round spot, and the stigma is divided by the rostellum, so it has two round lobes. Now what does, what does that mean? Where does it place you? Section parviflora. All of these are very consistently upside down, non resuming they have a divided stigma by the rostellum, so the two lobes. For the typical odontoglossum has only one lobe. And they look pretty similar. But then you have this little character here, Coplinionum again. It has the spot there. No other odontoglossum has that spot. Only these species. It has the divided stigma, but it also has features from the local conception. So what it does is actually tying these two sections together, showing, or indicating rather, suggesting that there is a close relationship between these uh, orchids. So if you keep them, if you want to keep Arviflora as what they were described as, so Arviflora uh, solenidiopsis, separate from one of the Lothrums, you would also have to accept that the Lothrum is actually a genus by itself, and then you have all this monotypic general, too complicated to my taste. Section colorato means colorful, the colorful flowers. Of course, they are easy to recognize. Those are the cochleodas. You may cringe in your uh, chairs here. Oh, I like cochleodas. I'm going to keep calling them cochleodas. Well, you, you can do that. Even I use the name cochleoda when I'm out in the field. But they are really genetically very close to all of the rosa. There are only a few species here, easy to recognize. The only problem is this one here, Nusriana. This is a typical form. I've seen hundreds of them in blue. Every single one has yellow calyx. Even the yellow form, or the albino form, has yellow calyx. Except this one. We found a single plant in a totally different population on the other side of the Andes in Peru. Single plant, and it has white calyx. Morphologically, they are identical. So what does that mean? We have to find more. We have only one single sample of, the, of this flower with white like cows. Interesting. Section Canaliculotum is a big section and has a wide variety of different looking flowers. But if you look at them from the side view, you can see they all have those canaliculated lips. They're pretty similar if you compare them. The, the length varies a little bit, but otherwise they're pretty much the same. There is a small group here, what I call the, the Wallisi group here. They have rather long basal lip, the lateral lobes here, which are also fused against the column at the base. Superficially, they resemble plants in the Lindleyanum series. But this is a sting because here, first of all, the lip bulb is free of the base, but the whole lip is fused against the column through a very fleshy, long ridge, which is unique to this group. So yes, they are in the canaliculatum section, but I call them a different series, the Lindleyanum series. You may call them whatever you want, but that's what I prefer. Nevadense series here. Well, it's silly to create the series based on one single plant. But again, you have to be consistent. And also sanguinum series. Both of these two have no close relationship uh, with other species, as far as I know. So I put them in separate series. But DNA places them close to other species in the Canalic Lobby. Harianum series. Again, they belong in the Canalic Lobby section, although the basal lobes are very small poorly developed, but they are there, and DNA supports putting it there. Some of you may want to have an argument about accepting the Colombian Harian as different from the Ecuadorian form. But look at this, how similar they are. And here are the side views. I think there's more combining them than separating. Finally, the section articulata, which the, with the flexible, the typical orthoglossum, so to speak. We have four uh, series, it's crispin series, crustadium series, granitum series, and epidendroides series. 
The type for the gene is no longer Gloucester belongs here. That's actually this particular species, evidently is. The crispum series consists of two flowers, or two species I said, crispum and nobly, very distinct, can't be confused with much of anything. Originally I wanted to place Honeywelliarum here as well because of morphological similarities, but then after having seen it in life, uh, it has been long gone for hundreds of years, for at least a hundred years in cultivation, so what you found it was quite a surprise. I realized that it's really so different from anything else, so I gave it a separate series again. The Christotum series is quite simple to recognize. They all have these very strong radiating keels, frequently colored with uh, stripes of purple, or red, or brown, and so on. An easy group. Corentum and Subeligerum series have smaller flowers with shorter columns, frequently without columns. But then look at this little guy here. I have problems uh, placing it somewhere. So I gave it a separate series all by itself. It's different because look at the shape of the anther cap here. You can actually see the pollinia underneath it. And if you disturb the flower, if you touch the flower with pollinaria, the, the anther cap falls off and the uh, pollinia end up on the stigma. So it's self-pollinating, which is unique in the whole genus. Suggesting that maybe something happened uh, with the pollinator a long time ago. Maybe there are no pollinators, so it's decided to keep out. There's nobody around here, no action going on, so I will take care of business myself. And then finally we have section article <coughs> in the uh, Epidendritis series the typical autoglossums. They have long, very long uh, columns, the longest in the genus, with large rectangular to, uh, rhomboid uh, columns. So where do we find autoglossums? Well, most of the species are in the Andean region, and uh, you have to look in cloud forest to find them. Of course, there's some of the species in the Ocidioides section also occur in Central America. Mariano Spino was correct. Odontoglossum is endangered, not through over-collecting, despite uh, looting millions of plants in the past century, but through habitat destruction. This is a uh, bell pepper field in southern Peru, the only known location for this species, Odontoglossum dracoseps, extremely rare. Only two plants are known. Uh, from Peru. Two plants were collected somewhere in Bolivia, but we don't know where. Fortunately, we have en enough material to cross-pollinate them because the Rondogosums are self compatible And uh, plants exist now in cultivation. If we can keep this going, we can say that it's, it's safe for the future, at least temporarily. Sometimes uh, plants end up in isolated areas, and uh, Odontoglossum is no exception from that. This is on uh, Odontoglossum uh, naive. In the 1960s or early 70s, when Eberhard von Vogel went to this place, he collected one plant, brought it back to Germany, and it survived in cultivation. Many divisions took off from there. And uh, this particular plant uh, grows in my friend Guido de Berchrede, I've learned to pronounce the name right, in his collection, and he grows it very, very well. Why he tried to pollinate, to self-pollinate, and it doesn't take. He tried many, many, many times. So finally people decided, well, let's go and try to find another plant. And eventually they started to turn up. Look at this beautiful photograph by David Haltemann. He went there and photographed it. Eventually Antonio Uribe, Steve Beckendorf, and many others went there to try to find more plants. And they ran into this character here, Luis Blanco, who happened to know where they were. So he generously climbed up, risking his life high up in the tree, got a plant, and gave it to Antonio. And eventually, pollination were made, cross-pollination, uh, thanks to international collaborations. And uh, here's a photo from uh, Colombo Tinias. There are thousands of these plants available today. And they grow well and they flower well. This is a successful story. This one is not. 
This is along the glossum crossiductulum, referring to fat fingers sticking out on the lip there. And uh, I'm just hitting the wrong button. Only two plants ever found, none of them exist in cultivation. So we have been back to one of the sites many times here in near Molina Pampa in Peru, looking for more plants without success. And you can see here, when you fracturize nature, you really destroy the possibilities for these plants to survive. We don't even know if it still exists, maybe extinct. Only two plants ever found. But the search goes on. We will never give up. The same thing was thought to have happened with the Odontoglossum povidana, but thanks to a real fluke uh, and a very fortunate uh, occasion with my friend Antonio Uribe went up to the place here and he almost stumbled over a blooming plant of this species. So he invited me and a few others to go up there and uh, we found a very nice little population, a couple of hundred plants, most of them in bloom, all growing along the river. But not a single seed pod, not a single flower pollinated that we could see. So this plant may actually be due because there are no pollinators around. So we decided to help nature a little bit there. The most exciting discovery or rediscovery uh, recently was when uh, Guido de Berfrede decided to uh, try to find the most important honey of the army. It has been considered a natural hybrid uh, by authorities, but it is not. But where to find it? We managed to locate an area in north of Bogota and uh, eventually also managed to find the plants. Thanks to Antonio Uribe, Juan Salvariaga and others. So that's, that's how you make progress, you work together. This is a very odd species. Uh, it doesn't look like anything else if you compare the lip here. It has only a single fat projecting calus here, white without any colors. Beautiful thing. It naturally hybridizes with crispum nobly and gloriosum. I'm not going to say much about this one, the crown jewel of, of Colombian orchids, because uh, Phil Sitton gave you a wonderful program the first day. Sorry if you missed it. Uh, it, oh, the only thing I can say is that it's locally abundant. Possibly thanks to, or, yeah, thanks to the terrible uh, civil war time that we've had here. Nobody has really dared to go out looking for these plants. But now they are there, and they flower, and they grow, and they are abundant. And you can still find a nice, great variety of, of the shapes. We can also find, find these uh, spotted varieties. They were thought to be extinct, but they're there, and they will keep breeding. Some of these spots may come from uh, previous uh, natural hybridization, but uh, that's just an assumption. We'll see. What I would like to say, though, is uh, in reference to what Mariana Ospina said, that we need to work together, uh, local people, scientists or culturalists, uh, environmentalists, and politicians, and everybody else to protect these wonderful, wonderful plants. And one good example of that is the establishment of uh, La Palma Orchid Reserve in the, the Sibindoy version, where Marta Kolonowska is working really hard to protect a very large area of forest where more of the most species occur than anywhere else in the world. It's a perfect Orontoglossum research. And uh, thanks to generous donation by the Orchid Conservation Alliance, this place can now be purchased and protected and, and managed by uh, local people as well. So, after 40 years of uh, research, hard work, uh, field work, and having a lot of good time, drinking a lot of beer, and so on, so on, so on, and uh, meeting lots of wonderful, wonderful friends and people, here represented by Steve Beckendorf from the Orchid Conservation Alliance. Uh, we have uh, Jan Södermark representing Swedish dairy farmers. And we have Guido de Bachleve here again representing Belgian uh, physicians. So people come from all kinds of areas in society working together, having a good time, and saving nature. Way to go. So I think it's time to tell the story of Odontoglossa. 
and if this book will be published this year or else. Invite three blind people, and then you round up an elephant somewhere. You place one person behind the elephant, one on the side, and one in front of it. And they, you ask them to describe what they have in front of them, you know, by patting, touching, whatever. Then you ask them to express what they see, or what actually what they feel. And you get a very different description of the same thing. You really don't know what you have. Only by combining those different versions, different approaches to the same thing, can you get a good idea of what you have in front of you. That's the same thing with orchid taxonomy. Only by combining molecular, uh, morphological features, uh, ecological features, anatomical features, whatever, any feature that you can add to the plot, combine them, and you will get a better understanding of what orchid taxonomy really should be all about. Thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate you listening. I don't hear any snoring. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to discuss it anytime, anyway.